All right. Uh, welcome back. Very happy to be here uh, to talk about uh, Scalafix. Uh, and the kind of subtitle is uh, Scala Meta for Everyday Tasks, because you will see for those that don't know about Scala Meta that Scalafix is mostly based on, on Scala Meta, so it's meta programming. A um, few words about me. Uh, I'm a staff engineer. Uh, I was on the management track for quite a while. I've been a Scala professional for about 10 years, but I'm no longer in the, in the Scala world, so for me this is a way to connect and reconnect to the community. Uh, and I'm the Scala Fix maintainer since uh, 2020. Uh, my employer, Swile, um, we're doing uh, something between FinTech and WorkTech in France and in Brazil. Uh, the most popular product is the Tiki Resto, the meal voucher uh, card. Um, we're still growing and we're profitable. Uh, we're a Ruby shop, so this is completely different trade-offs than what we're actually looking at today. Uh, but we're hiring, uh, so yeah, in case you're interested, just uh, don't hesitate to talk to me afterwards. All right, so maybe let's just start with a quick get to know about the audience. Who has used Scalafix in the past? All right, I think that's about third, maybe a fourth of the audience. Who has written a Scalafix rule? Okay, I see three, four people, so definitely less. So yeah, this talk will give a brief intro introduction to the tool itself, and then we'll look uh, more into how you can use it to do your kind of everyday tasks about migration or about writing code. So a very quick intro, uh, Scalafix is a linter and a rewriting tools, tool, sorry. Um, so first use case, lint, I'm not gonna tell you anything, but this is an example where you want to maybe uh, prevent usage of var in your code. There's a built-in rule that allows that and it will just kind of fail the build or whatever you do on your CI if you're using a var. Pretty, uh, pretty simple, pretty obvious. Where, where Scalafix gets very interesting is that it not only can generate diagnostics or uh, lints, but it can also uh, affect your source code. So a popular um, rule is called remove and used, which as the name says, uh, it's gonna remove uh, imports, uh, local variables, parameters that are not used. So in that example, the, the concurrent future, future is not used, so the tool will automatically remove it from your source code. That's what we call rewrites. And rewrites are not necessarily uh, removals. You can also have this example of the uh, name literal, so parameter literal, so it just adds, for example here, wherever you have an invocation with a literal such as true, it will add the name of the parameter for more readability. So that's effectively what, what Scalafix is about. Uh, this is my one and only pitch slide, and then after we'll, we'll be more uh, technical. But so, wh wh why using Scalafix? Uh, it has a lot of advantages for users, so people using the product. It has a, a lot of, a couple of uh, built-in rules, but you can also, as we will see, extend it through custom rules from the community or from yourself. Uh, you can suppress the rules, like any linter, and it's both CI-friendly and developer-friendly uh, with all the tooling that has been developed around Scalafix. And for rule authors, which is kind of the meat of this presentation, uh, it's, as I said, very, uh, it's, it's, it's really based on Scala Meta. So Scala Meta, for those that don't know, is what powers uh, Scala FMT, uh, the formatter, I think the de facto formatter of the Scala world, and Metals, uh, the, the language server that allows uh, Veeam or VS Code to navigate um, Scala code. And both uh, features of, of Scala Meta, the abstract syntax trees, which we'll look at after, and the semantic DB information is heavily used by, by Scalafix. And it's also extensible. Uh, you'll see that there's a lot of tooling uh, to make it easy to uh, write custom rules. About adoption, or rather about the ecosystem integration, it's, it's a mature project. As you will see, it's uh, eight years old now. So it's, it has most of the integration you can think of. Uh, SBT, obviously. This is the, the, the kind of uh, the, the most powerful integration we have. Uh, and then there's a lot of community-driven uh, plugins for Mill, for Gradle, even for Maven. Uh, Bazel is still ongoing. There's a lot of work from uh, Eugene Yokota, uh, SBT maintainer. Um, I think lately, I think it was last year. So let's say it's just it's working, but it's still very rough on the edges. And I think there, there are plans uh, from the Scala CLI integration, but no effort has been started uh, as of now. And then you have like bigger integration. I think the most famous one is Scala Steward. So Scala Steward, for those that don't know, is the tool that allows uh, whether 
open source project or corporate wants to automatically bump the versions as they come out. And you can also register your Scala fix rules. For example, facilitate the migration from Zio library to another one. Um, that's a way to run Scala fix automatically. And obviously, there's also a very good integration in Metals. Uh, the organized import uh, code action from Metals is based on Scala fix. So it's written as a Scala fix rule. There's a way to, from Metals to write, uh, to, to run, sorry, Scala fix rules. Uh, but there's still no, the, the, the support could be even better because the, the, the the diagnostics, the lints, uh, and the rewrites, you cannot select them one by one. But still, it's a, it's a pretty good integration. So, fairly good adoption in the ecosystem. Uh, there are a few other options, <coughs> sorry, uh, on, the, on the market uh, for uh, linters and code transformers. I've listed three here. I think that's the most active ones. Uh, the first one that maybe some of you use is a wart remover, also a very mature and old project. Uh, which is uh, also based on rules. The only difference is that it really um, it really works at the compiler level. So whatever you want to do on your uh, source code, you need to understand the internals of the compiler, and also you need to write things twice, once for Scala 2, once for .t, for Scala 3. Uh, and it's a linter only, so you don't have the capability to rewrite your code. So it's a big difference. And, and a cool feature that was added uh, recently, uh, both on the 2.13 track and the Scala 3 track, is something called quick fixes, or actionable diagnostics. I don't think it's very popular yet, but it's a way uh, for the compiler to signal to the IDE that, uh, that some things could be done. For example, um, I don't remember exactly what, what, what has been implemented until now, but they will really appear as uh, code action, and you, you can click on it, and then it will affect your... Um, the compiler itself will rewrite the, the source code. Uh, the gotcha with that is that uh, these quick fixes must be defined in the compiler. Uh, and integrated in the, in the compiler code base. Uh, also, they need to be duplicated for 2.13 and Scala 3. So definitely not something you can use on a daily basis. It's more like a f f foundation uh, actions that you need to do. <coughs> and the last one, which I think is, 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 is omnipresent, it's IntelliJ. I think we all used, or maybe most of us have used IntelliJ at one point in our career. And you have this powerful refactoring actions uh, which, uh, which is completely based on the custom tool chain and you cannot enforce it on CI. So it's very good from a developer's perspective, but when you want to integrate that into CI, it comes quite short. Um, all right, uh, just a few words on the, um, on the project activity. Uh, these are um, kind of the major direct and indirect contributors, as well as their sponsor. So you can see uh, over time, uh, from 2016, uh, the genesis of the project, all the way to 2023, uh, the different uh, contributors to it. Uh, the green dots are non-sponsored contributors, uh, the orange ones are uh, sponsored contributors, and the red ones are sponsored by Scala Center. So originally, Scala, uh, Scala Fix was, uh, was uh, I think it was started as Scala Center by uh, Olafur, which is also the main author of Scala FMT which you probably know. Uh, and he worked at the Scala Center for four years uh, on the project, and he's really the, 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 the main author of ScalaFix. Then a lot of work, foundation work, was done at Twitter by uh, Eugene Brumaco, uh, also from 2016 to 2018 or 19. Uh, and then I think there's a second wave of contributors that started in 2020 when the tool reached maturity and were I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's feature complete, but at least it's stable enough so that we don't have to add a lot of, uh, of features. So you can see it's a, it's a mixed bag of uh, sponsored and unsponsored, so it's, it's pretty cool to see, uh, to see that. Um, just a quick recap on the contributions. As I said, it's a mature project. You can see the number of PRs per year is decreasing. Last year we had 62 PRs, uh, excluding the Pandabot and, and Stewart PRs. Uh, and the number of individual, of unique contributors is also uh, decreasing. Uh, you can see that there's been a lot of work, foundation work in 2017-18, and then we're more into a mature uh, maintenance, keeping up with the ecosystem phase now. Um, so this, are, this is the, the stats I pulled from Sonotype, uh, showing the, the monthly downloads uh, bro broken down by, by version of Scalafix. Uh, it's interesting to see that uh, even though the tool existed since 2016, the, the adoption really started to pick up around 2020. I think the fact that it's integrated in metals, of course, uh, contributes to that. Uh, 
but yeah, you, you can see, I think we're, we're plateauing now in terms of usage, and you can see that uh, there's still a, a kind of a lot of time, it takes about six months when a new release comes out for the whole community, for half of the community to adopt it. So it's, it's really a long tail of work, and that's, that's why there's so much we do around backward compatibility, uh, because tooling is, a, tooling is here to last. So. All right, enough with the, the intro, let's go more into the, how it works. Um, so, first of all, I'm gonna use a bit of, a, a few of the built-in rules, so the ones that you will get uh, automatically when you pull ScalaFix. Um, most of the, the most famous one, disabled syntax, which we've seen in the first slide, which, for example, uh, forbid usage of a var. Uh, redundant syntax, which is a variant of it, remove and use, I talked about it already, and explicit result types, which is actually the most uh, advanced um, rule, and that has been uh, instrumental, at least for some people, to annotate where there was no, when there was, <coughs> sorry, when there was no annotation in the Scala 2 code base, to add annotation so that the migration to Scala 3 is, um, is easier. Uh, so it's a matrix, as you can, t as you can tell. Uh, we're not going to cover the explicit result types kind of rules because they're a bit more complex and they kind of break the promise of ScalaFix that, that you write portable, that doesn't, portable rules that don't, uh, that don't rely on the compiler. So let's put that on the side for today. Uh, we'll look at the syntactic uh, rules, which are only browsing the tree without having any information about what the symbols actually represent. And a semantic rule, uh, remove and used. And you can see that, uh, as I said, it's a, both a, a linter tool and a rewriting tool. So some patches, some rules, uh, sorry, will only raise warnings, lints, while others might suggest you uh, what you can do to fix the warning. So that's the difference. All right, so let's take a, a very simple example. We have this hello world uh, source file, um, Scala 3 source file. And we want to apply two rules to this um, source file. The first one being remove and use. So that's the configuration file you have from ScalaFix here, similar to the Scala FMT conf, if you, if you know it. Um, and we are just saying that we want two rules to run. And we are actually customizing uh, the disabled syntax to say that we don't want to use println, because maybe we want to enforce the usage of a logger or God knows what. All right. so. The first thing that happens, uh, and that happens under the hood, because all the tooling around ScalaFix is here to help you, is that at compile time, so that's uh, Scala C running, uh, we add a uh, metals plugin that will generate information, that will capture information uh, that the compiler uh, exports into a file, a protobuf file, uh, which has like, a text representation there. Uh, and that gives basically uh, information about um, well everything that you have in the source files, but typed. So it's you could say that it's uh, for those that know Tasty, the, the the AST representation in Scala 3. It's kind of a stripped down version of it uh, that is available both for Scala 2 and Scala 3. And that's also what Metals use to provide uh, semantic information, uh, code navigation. So semantic DB is a, um, a standard uh, in, from Scala Meta that most of the tooling uh, currently uh, relies on. So first step, we generate uh, this, uh, this semantic DB information. All right, second one, we initialize the Scala fix. Uh, so as I said, we want to, to run two rules. So these are gonna be the, the in, in the wheels here. The first one will be remove and use, and then we'll go to, to, to the disable syntax. All right, so what, what happens first? Uh, the first thing is that we're gonna parse the source file to generate an abstract syntactic tree out of it. So it's pretty large, even though the, the, the source file is, is small, so I just basically uh, took the second line and what the second line would map uh, in, um, in the abstract syntax tree. So this is done only once for all rules, and then each rule will get fed this abstract syntax tree uh, later. But the remove and use, as we saw earlier, needs information. It needs to know what is actually used in the source file or not. So it needs to get information from the semantic DB. So remove and use basically merge information from the abstract syntax tree and from the semantic DB information. And what it generates is a rewrite. So symbolized here by a, by a pen that we just put there and that we'll apply later on. Off we go to the second rule. 
uh, disable syntax. So disable syntax is a syntactic rule that is only emitting uh, lint. The fact that it's a syntactic rule means that it doesn't need information from the compiler, so it doesn't actually uh, take uh, the, the semantic DB file as, a, as an input. And what it generates is a uh, diagnostic warning, so to say. So once we have uh, executed these uh, two rules uh, internally in ScalaFix, it's time to apply them. So the first one is a, is a patch, it's a rewrite, and the direct effect of that is that we're going to remove uh, this import because it's not used. So your source file is actually updated in line, and the line is removed. And the second one is a lint, and the lint will just give you a, a warning or an error, depending on how you set up your, your configuration, which is the same as what we saw in the first slide. It shows you that someone in your code has been using println. And of course, it could maybe uh, a more advanced version of that would be that it turns the println to a logger instance. So you could convert this uh, lint only rule to a rewriting rule. All right, so this is how it works. Now we're gonna go uh, more into details into how, um, how you can understand what's going on so that you can write your custom rules. The first uh, tool that is very interesting, it's called uh, astexplorer.net. Um, so thanks to Scala.js and the fact that Scala Meta is compiled uh, for Scala.js, we can actually use that in a browser. So this tool, uh, which is a web app, you just paste your code on the left, uh, so the same code as I showed you earlier, and it automatically generates the abstract syntax tree for, um, for, your, for your code. And what's really cool also is that there's a co concept of position, so as you over your mouse on either side, the, 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 other, the other part, the counterpart, is also highlighted. So for example here, I was putting my, uh, my mouse on the try, I think, and then you can see which element in the tree it corresponds to. So it's very useful when you don't know anything about tree and it can be a bit uh, overwhelming to get to know uh, how to parse it. So if you don't know the tool, I would recommend just, you can paste uh, your, your own code and then get a feeling for what uh, the Scala meta abstract uh, syntax tree is. So a lot, of, a lot of trees here, so your program itself is a tree. There's also a, a tree hierarchy for the tree type. Uh, so for example, uh, you have declaration, definitions, uh, and as you can see in the, on, the, on the right here, uh, a, a val could be either a definition or a declaration. So you have this tree uh, that is very useful in, in, in your mind to, um, to, to, to know basically how the, the code is, is, is parsed. So these are Scala meta uh, trees. There's, a, there's an intermediate representation, so still going back to my source code, which is called tokens. Uh, so it's the very first step of uh, the Scala meta run. And as you, as you can guess, uh, it's just tokenize your source code. Uh, so it, it's quite long as well, so I omitted the end here. And then you get to trees. And what's very interesting, and uh, of course key to, uh, to ScalaFix usage, is that you have uh, position information in these tokens and trees. So, um, for example here, uh, again still uh, highlighting the Scala util try, you can see which tokens correspond to um, the actual um, lines in your source and which trees um, uh, are also corresponding to that. And that's what uh, ScalaFix uses to patch or to remove stuff from the, from the original file. All right, uh, so now that we know a bit about the trees, um, uh, what we're gonna do is to traverse it or to collect information from it. Um, and the main uh, method is a collect uh, method which takes a partial function and will just basically browse the tree uh, in, a, in a very simple fashion. And as you browse your tree, you might, uh, well, either do side effects or collect something that you will, uh, accumulate something that you will use afterwards. So for example here, uh, the, the tree traversal of that uh, tree is, is very simple. We're gonna call your partial function on importer, then we go down to select, to name, and so forth and so on. So it's really just a descent into your tree. Um, and the only thing you have to do is implement your partial function. Um, I'm just going to talk quickly about something called quasi-quotes, which maybe people uh, that have been writing macros in Scala 2 uh, are familiar with. It's a construct from Scala Meta that uh, hides a bit of the complexity of the tree by providing a macro or a set of macros 
that converts uh, normal or what looks like normal Scala code into the corresponding tree. So for example, this piece of code um, is uh, expanded, so you, you can use the X phase typer uh, when you compile this file to see what the macro looks like. So the import, uh, importer is a macro that gets uh, expanded to that. And what's interesting is that you can see, uh, you can find again uh, the same tree as we had before. So quasi quotes is also a very good tool when you don't know the tree to get a feeling for what's behind it. Uh, but it has his own gochas, so I will talk about it later. All right, second tool that is very useful and maybe not as known as the AST Explorer is something uh, called by, um, uh, something created by, uh, I don't remember his, his name, uh, but someone very uh, influential in the, in, the, in the Japanese community, uh, which is called Scala Meta AST, uh, which, uh, not, not sure it's very clear, but the, the input is also on the left, and I, I just put one line here, so the import. And what it does is that it prepares uh, Scala fix rules, so what you see on, on, the, on the right is a Scala fix rule, a syntactic rule, uh, actually, which prepares your traversal uh, by uh, calling the collect function we just looked at and by pattern matching on what you have on the left. So it's a very, very interesting uh, feature because if you start from scratch, you just put your code and then you can iterate easily on whether you want to, 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 to maybe to pattern match only on the try or only on the util sub package or whatever. But it's, it's, it's great uh, to, to get started. So very, very, very useful tool. It also allows you to see tokens because I as, you, uh, as we will see, a Scala fix can work on trees, but also on tokens. So great, uh, great tool um, that I really uh, recommend for anyone starting up writing uh, Scala fix rules or Scala meta for that matter. All right, so now, now that we looked at how we traverse the tree uh, and, and get syntactic information, the, the added value of Scalafix is really to get access to semantic information. So semantic is inform information is whatever the compiler uh, gives you. The most popular is probably the symbol lookups. So thanks to two methods, uh, a symbol method on tree uh, that gets added, added uh, automatically through an implicit, you can get information from the type checker. So if you go back to my first slide, uh, at compile time, we capture information from the compiler in a semantic DB file, and this semantic DB file can be fed at rule execution time to, uh, well, to, to know, for example, this, this, um, this element of the tree, is it really referencing a, a mutable or an immutable collection? This is the information you can get. And, and you would have to infer that if you were just looking at the tree, because um, depending on the imports, what's in scope and so on. So, so that's the symbol lookups. Uh, another cool information is something we call synthetics. Uh, so synthetics is everything that the compiler adds, but that you don't really see in your source code. So for example, when you, when you apply something, it automatically calls the apply method, and you can see it there. Uh, implicit param application, so see exactly what gets uh, passed. Uh, and as I said, the syntactic sugar. So this is also another helper that helps you um, maybe pick the elements of the tree that you're interested in and, and, and leave uh, the other ones off. And the last one, which is uh, key actually in, uh, in the remove and use rule, is diagnostics. Diagnostics is something uh, that is at the end of the semantic file and is basically the output uh, of the compiler. All the warnings with their uh, contextualized in the sense that you know exactly where the warning, the same as the caret you see in the, in the standard output. Uh, all the warnings are there, so you can reuse it and map them to element of the tree. For example, to remove stuff that is not used. Uh, but it can be also uh, deprecation, so you can have a rule that automatically uh, rewrites stuff that is deprecated, for example. All right, so we've seen how we could, uh, we could inspect the trees uh, with syntactic information and with semantic information. Now we want to take action um, from that. And uh, most of the action you can do on uh, Scalafix is here. Um, I've simplified a bit, but that's, uh, that's the ADT that uh, actually um, Scalafix uses. It's called patch. Uh, so you don't have access to the full ADT, but you have it through the, the companion uh, object. We have a lot of helper methods. And you can see the first one, uh, which is the lint. Um, so the lint, uh, the lint is, uh, is effectively, uh, as, as we saw earlier, a diagnostic, and diagnostic refers to part of the tree and uh, attach a message to it. 
Then you have all the token related um, methods. So you can remove a token, replace it with the string of your choice, add something on the left of the token, add something on the right, and you have exactly the same methods for trees. So you can prepend an annotation to a function, for example, using uh, add left, uh, once you have found the tree element corresponding to the function you want to annotate, uh, and, and so on. So that's effectively the only thing, uh, going back to the collect method that we looked at when you traverse the tree, uh, the, the t-type, the, the collect method is generic in t, uh, the t-type is most of the time a patch type that you will accumulate as you traverse the tree, and you will get a list of patches that can be combined and applied afterwards. All right, so that's pretty much it for the API. So you traverse your tree, uh, you pick up the trees that, uh, that are uh, relevant for your use case, and then you generate patches out of it. Now just a few words about how, um, how you iterate, how you write actually the, the, the rules, because this was quite theoretical. Um, to get started, there is a Gitterate um, template that you can uh, well, easily uh, invoke, and what it creates is a very simple structure with all the key elements that you will need to write a rule. So I'm not gonna go in, in details, but uh, that's pretty much just the first thing you should do if you want to write a custom rule. Then a very uh, cool feature of uh, ScalaFix is it's called the test kit, um, and the test kit allows you to do expects test, I think that's, uh, that's the term, and then expects test is something where you put the input and the output. And if, of course, applying ScalaFix to the input doesn't generate the output, your test will fail. So for example here, I took an example from the name literal argument um, rule, which, uh, which should add a name parameter to functions uh, that, that are applied with, with literals. So the, the, red, the thing on the, re on, the, on the right that are red is what we expect the rule to do. And there's also stuff that we expect the rule not to do. For example, the, the, line, uh, the line that has a comment has a suppression comment. Uh, it's ScalaFix OK. And we don't want, for some reason, that line to be annotated. And by having this, we make sure that this doesn't happen. So in, 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 the, in the structure, it's, really it's very simple. It's just two different uh, directories, the input one and the output one. And the test will run automatically to make sure that your rule does uh, what you expect to. So very, very powerful uh, way of testing. And uh, last but not least, how do you deploy your, your rule? I think that's maybe the most uh, tricky thing. Uh, if it's only a rule for you, then uh, you might but probably just run it from source because ScalaFix can, you just point at it, uh, you just point at, at a resource, whether it's a file, whether it's a, an HTTP uh, um, URL or a GitHub URL, and it will automatically compile the rule on the fly. Uh, but there are a few lim limitations. The first one is that it has to be uh, self-contained, so everything needs to be in one file. So when you write complex rules, it can get quite hairy. And you cannot have more dependencies than ScalaFix or ScalaMeta. So if you were to write um, a rule to facilitate the migration from your corporate um, library from one version to the other, you probably want the library to be um, in the dependency, and you can't, you can't do that. And again, source, compa source compatibility is, um, we're really trying to keep it, uh, uh, to keep it. Uh, it's been almost actually eight, year, eight years. I don't think we've introduced any major uh, breaking changes, but it's not guaranteed. So as we release new major version, there's always a risk that the text file that you wrote two years ago will not actually compile uh, by the latest, with the latest version. So the most uh, canonical way to do it is to publish your rule to Maven or your own Nexus, if you're a corporation, uh, and, then, uh, and then point uh, the execution to uh, the artifact that you want. So just regular artifact, like a library, uh, you just load your rules this way. And it's not as complicated as it seems uh, to publish something to, to Maven Central. Uh, we actually have a lot of documentation about that in the Scalafix. Another cool, uh, another cool feature is that if you have a monorepo or, or, or a monolith uh, in SBT, there's a way to create an SBT project that is dedicated to rules. So if, if you have a business rules, for example, uh, you want uh, your controller to be in a certain package, you want, I don't know, whatever you can think of, and that's, very re that's only relevant to your project, then there's no need to publish it or to compile it automatically. Uh, you just create your own SBT module 
and Scalafix will compile it for you and apply the rules on your local project. That's also quite documented on the, on the website. And the last one, uh, last but not least, Scala Stewart, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, maybe, maybe some of you have been exposed to Scalafix without even knowing it, just because uh, Scala Stewart run a migration, uh, a rewrite rule that the library maintainer uh, wrote for you and registered in Scala Stewart. So the way it works is that you only need to open a PR on Scala Stewart for open source project or uh, change the configuration if you run Scala Stewart locally and say, if you bump from one to two, run this Scala fix migration and Scala Stewart will do everything else for you using Scala fix. Before uh, opening up for questions, uh, just a couple of do's and don'ts. Um, so I, I mentioned quasi quotes, uh, Scala meta quasi quotes. It's good, uh, but it's very easy to get, get it, to get it wrong. So I would say use it for prototyping, and once you know that your rule is working as it should, go back to a tree structure uh, because you you might, for example, forget that uh, this might be generic or this might have a second list of arguments could be carried whatever. It, the, the the syntax of, of Scala is quite complex, so. So by having the tree, you're forced to think about all different use cases so that you don't have false positives or false negatives. Formatting. Uh, form we, we, obviously, ScalaFix is trying to preserve the formatting, uh, but formatting is hard, very hard, and Scala FMT does it very well. So when you write a rule, don't worry too much about formatting and just ask your user to run Scala FMT afterwards. This is much easier and it will avoid a lot of headaches. Uh, check that your rule is idempotent. Uh, of course, if it's a, even if it's a migration rule, it's important that if you run the rule twice, uh, well, the definition of idempotency, that is the same as, uh, as running your rule once. It's, it's a very important uh, property because you don't know exactly when and how your rule will be, ruled, will be executed. Um, and then there's something I didn't cover which is called atomic on the patch um, IDT, which allows you to say, okay, I want all these patches to be either applied all of them or none of them. Uh, and that's a way, uh, that's the only way actually Scalafix can honor the suppression warning. And if you, if you do a rewrite or a, sorry, a rename in the file, you don't want to rename uh, the declaration, uh, but not the invocation. So by, by using Atomic, you can uh, say that one patch at the top of the file is connected to a patch at the, at the bottom. And if you have a suppression in one or the other, you should <laughs> not apply anything. So it's very important. Something I didn't mention uh, is how you generate um, the, the strings that are going to replace uh, your, your, your source. If you remember in the patch API, there was add left, add right. The first argument was a tree or a token, and the second one is a string. You can write um, the string yourself, uh, like writing a def or whatever, whatever source code you want to generate. But the good thing to do is to use actually a Scala meta tree and to the reverse operation of parsing, which is called pretty printing. So parsing converts a source file to a tree, pretty printing uh, converts a tree to a source file. And why is it important is that because you don't really control which dialect, so which Scala version your user might be running. So by doing that, you can automatically uh, use curly braces or not if the guy is using Scala 3 or whatever. So that's uh, very important. Some don'ts, um, don't store state in the rule instance. Uh, it's actually generated a, a quite nasty bug in the organize import rule uh, lately. Don't compare Scala meta trees with uh, equality. Just always use pattern matching. Uh, there's a subtle reason for that, but I'm not gonna go in details. And when you patch, when you rewrite a file, make sure you target the tokens and the trees as narrow as you can, because if you patch too much, then you might have conflict with overlapping patches. And even though uh, the patch is an ADT and you can combine them, there's, if, if you have an overlapping patch that are conflicting, then you will end up with junk in your source code. That's it for me. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, and the slides are there if you want to, um, to have a look at them. Thank you. And you may ask your questions in French, obviously. Uh, 
thanks for the talk. One problem with, with uh, lots of rewriting systems are that your rules can accidentally have contradictions or loops. Find AB and change to BA, and another rule, find BA and change to AB. Is that just a hard problem that the user has to debug, or is there something in the system to help with this? Yeah, uh, that's a, uh, indeed, it's a, it's, it's a hard problem. Uh, I don't think we have any support in the API or in the test kit to enforce that. Uh, one idea that has been uh, around is to, well, first make sure that the rule is idempotent. So by automatically, when you had the input and the output, um, executing, executing the rule twice and making sure that uh, you don't get, you don't like go back, like as you said, A and B. Uh, but yeah, it's hard, and I don't think there's like a silver bullet to, to solve that. So you, you need to be very careful about that. Of course, it depends. If, if, you, if you write a, a Scala fixed rule for yourself or for your team, it's very easy to foresee the different scenarios. But if you open it for the community, or if you, if you upstream it in the Scala fixed repository, then it's, it's hard. So I, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, it's, it's hard. Dealing with uh, abstract syntax tree and rewriting them is, is a tough. And, uh, and I think Scalafic is trying to make it accessible, but it still remains, uh, there are a lot of challenges. Other questions? I think we have a lot of time. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, do you have anything planned for facilitating the code generation um, kind of problems? Like, in particular, I'm thinking about um, data classes that are not really easy to migrate or to sort of evolve in a binary compatible way. Um, and it's been suggested, I think, in the Scala user forum that maybe Scalafix would be a good uh, solution for this kind of stuff. Yeah, good question. So, yeah, I focused on the linter and kind of rewriter aspect of, of Scalafix, but there's also a way to generate new file uh, completely out of your... Uh, actually, I think I might have a slide, a backup slide here. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see if I can put it here and skip slide. Okay. So, I think the, the use case you described is this one. Uh, you have a annotation or whatever from your source file and you want to generate uh, well, all the boilerplates uh, with the best practice when it comes to backward compatibility and so on. Uh, it's possible. Uh, it's not easy. Like, you need to hook in some SBT magic if you're using SBT. Uh, Ulla Fur, the original author of, um, of Scalafix, has a, a template for that, so you can, you can paste it. And, and this is an actual uh, rule. It's called, I think it's called, uh, well, data data scalafix or whatever, uh, and it works. It's just a bit cumbersome. Uh, so I don't think that's an area where there's a lot of focus, uh, but contributions are welcome, as usual. Uh, and it's, it's definitely possible. I think we just need to, like, like all tooling, if we had a bit of sugar around it, it would, it, would get, uh, it would get easier. And there's still, because you could ask, okay, why don't you just do that with Scalameta directly? Uh, but I think there's a little value in scalafix uh, because of its integration instead of going raw Scalameta. So it's possible, uh, it's just not easy at the moment. Any other question? If, if you have other questions, uh, we're on uh, the Scalameta uh, Discord on the Scalafix channel, so uh, you can join there if you want. All right, thank you very much.